Welcome to the June edition of Aletheia for 2017. We're looking forward to a very exciting evening tonight uh, with some very interesting guests on our panel. Uh, of course, the topic being creationism and evolution, and how does Christianity fit in with the theory of evolution? How can it relate to each other? So we're going to be starting today with a brief introduction by one of our Aletheia team, who is Ragei, uh, who will be introducing some of the issues that we'll be talking about today, and then we'll move to the panel part of the night, which will be most of the night. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to the capable hands of Ragei. Thank you. Thanks, Abuna. Um, we'll get right into it. Uh, our talks are a little bit longer, but today we'll be, um, we'll be having a lot of fortune with the, the panelists giving uh, more than just the brief summary I'll start with. Okay, so getting right into it, uh, we'll use terms, and obviously today's talk is about evolution. So using um, the, the succinct def definition from the Oxford Dictionary, Evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are believed to have developed from earlier forms during the history of the Earth, uh, or also evolution is used in other terms to mean uh, progression, gradual development of something into another thing. We'll also be using uh, other terms like natural selection. Uh, so this is a more specific form of uh, describing evolution, which was to the, the better mic. Um, so, for example, Darwin's finches and also the peppered moth are variations of one particular thing into another thing. Um, so where does evolution fit into this? We're going to obviously talk about how DNA is the, the core component that takes these traits and passes them on. Um, and also we'll probably be talking about uh, how there are traits which are locked in known as the genotype, so what's already sort of set in the DNA, but is also what is going to be expressed physically uh, into that offspring. Again, part of our discussion will involve talking about macroevolution or um, some of the more controversial topics of one species becoming another or also the gradual, de gradual development uh, from multiple species across a period of time. And less controversial things like artificial selection, which is something that we um, see in everyday sort of practice or life, um, such as the breeding of dogs. So to quote Charles Darwin, a fair result gained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each equation. Uh, I think that's a very fair assessment of what we want to try and achieve today. Uh, and we do have a few views which uh, they'll obviously discuss before we get into the panel of questions. And also, we'll try and be a little bit lighthearted about this. Um, sometimes some views are unequal, sometimes views are just equal but from different perspectives. Um, so again, let's just uh, be jovial with each other um, and have a very enjoyable night. Some of the different perspectives that might be discussed today, um, I'll only summarize very quickly three things. Uh, one, which we call for today atheistic evolution or evolution without a supernatural or divine influence. Uh, the explanation, very, very simply, is that the world and everything that exists in it can be explained uh, through natural uh, processes which science can help. There we go. Um, another perspective we might talk about today is theistic evolution, uh, which can branch out into many different forms, but basically it's creation and evolution, which does require or um, has been shown to have a divine or supernatural influence. Uh, and sometimes some of these different perspectives are more specific, such as young earth creationism, uh, where there is a divine influence um, and it's undergone uh, a very quick transformation from the beginning of the Earth 
until now in a very limited or literal understanding of the Bible. And that's basically it. So uh, I'll get back to Abuna and um, we'll try and introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Shage. Um So that sets us up nicely. And by the way, before we proceed, I know that toilet paper um, cartoon was meant to represent sort of something on which there can be different opinions, but I disagree completely. I think there is only one opinion on that. The leaves need to be on the outside. And I'm sorry, but anyone who disagrees is just wrong. Um, all right, so today we have some lovely panelists with us. Um, before I introduce them, I would just like to note, because I know that some of you uh, may not have been to Alethea before, this is an unusual kind of group in that we're not going to be giving you nice black and white answers so you can leave at the end of the night and say, oh, I know what all about evolution. What we're going to be doing is trying to pick the brains of our brain trust over here to try and develop a better understanding of the issues that are involved to give you a better grasp so that you can think about it for yourself and come to your conclusions uh, about what you think works and what you think doesn't work. So our rule in these meetings is that you can say anything you like, nothing is off limits, so long as you are courteous. And I will be reminding you of that when we get to the second half of the night where we'll be inviting questions from the audience. Uh, and our panelists, of course, are all very courteous gentlemen. Uh, we have with us first to my left, Professor Michael Archer, AM. Um, many, many letters after his name, many of which begin with F, including the Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and a distinguished fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales. Um, he has been professor at the School of Biological and Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of New South Wales since 1978. That's qu quite a while. Um, he's the head of the VIP research program in the Pangaea Research Centre. He was curator of mammals at the Queensland Museum from 1972 to 1978, director of the Australian Museum from 1999 to 2003, dean of science at the University of New South Wales from 2004 to 2009. He has way too many books, publications, awards, TED Talks, etc. to mention tonight, but you can find him on the UNSW website if you're interested in uh, reading some of his work. And he's hard at work at the De-Extincting Australia's Extinct Gastric Brooding Frog Project. So he's working on this wonderful idea of trying to bring back extinct animals um, using, I believe, like by, by reconstructing their DNA and therefore bringing them back into the world, which would be such a wonderful thing. We look forward to the day. I believe one of the projects has been the Tasmanian tiger, who's been gone for, well, since the early 20th century. And um, he has engaged in many debates with creationists over the years, including where we found him in a chapter in a book called Confronting Creationism. And he's been kind enough to join us today, and we welcome him and are very happy to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> Next to him is Dr. Abram Phillips, who is one of the founding members of our Alethea group. Um, one of the reasons we're all sitting here today is because of Abram, who was a very um, annoying young man standing in the church courtyard asking all sorts of difficult questions, and we thought, we're going to have to do something about this young man and the people like him, and that's how Alethea came around, basically. Um, he is currently uh, working in the public hospital system as a resident doctor and has been interested in the intersection between science and faith for quite a while, and has given quite a few talks at our Alethea meetings as well on various topics to do with that. So we welcome Abram. And last but not least, by any means, uh, Father Doru Kostaki, I hope I pronounced that pro properly, uh, who is a Doctor of Theology uh, from the University of Bucharest and has lectured at the University of Bucharest and at St. Andrew's Greek Orthodox Theological College here in Sydney. He's currently an honorary associate of the Department of Studies of Religion at the University of Sydney, and he is co-founder and president of the Australian Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies, which is an exciting new group that I think it only started this year. Father, is that right? 
Um, well that, that's looking at the interaction between Orthodox Christianity and the world and the culture that we live in. And uh, if I can just do a quick plug, um, we strongly recommend an upcoming conference that's being held uh, by that society on Friday the 30th of June. It's on a topic very similar to what we're doing today, relating science and religion. And uh, some excellent guest speakers, I believe, at, the, at that conference. Uh, I believe we have posted a link to it on the event page on Facebook for the event today. So you can follow that link to get the details. And uh, I'll, I hopefully I'll be there sitting in the audience and having a wonderful time. Uh, he's also a senior lecturer in theology in patristic studies with the Sydney College of Divinity and is currently teaching at St. Cyril's Coptic Orthodox Theological College. Uh, and has a long-standing interest in the Orthodox Christian interpretation of the first three chapters of Genesis. And we thank Father Doru for coming and joining us this evening. Now, just to let you know, we did also try to invite uh, someone from Creation Ministries International, which is the Young Earth Creationist Group. Unfortunately, they were not able to provide anyone to join us today. So we'll have to do without them. So we're going to begin today by giving each of the panelists just a, a, a few minutes to summarize for us their view or their approach to the theory of evolution. And we're going to start with Professor Archer. Thank you, Antonio. Can we uh, get that going? Terrific. Um, I'm going to risk damaging you all. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't help saying I love these kinds of topics and these discussions, but often there's a polarized viewpoint which separates the science from the theology. And as we'll hear tonight, I think that this is not necessarily a healthy or appropriate separation. But I'm going to tackle another one very briefly at the moment, and it's the whole idea about death. I'm busy teaching my first year students to try to understand the unity of life. And in understanding, what I'm communicating to, that, to them is that there has only ever been on planet Earth one organism. It's three and a half billion years old, and it's what I've called the shape-changing, um, time-traveling bio-blob. And there's a really important reason for that. I'm arguing there can be no death. It doesn't, you don't require religion to become immortal. If you really become a good biologist and you grasp the understanding, of how every cell that has ever been alive on planet Earth is in physical connection with every other sing single cell back along the, the dimension of time. Everything we look at today, we think about length, width, and height. That's the way we sort of perceive things, and that's the way we think we, we are. All these individuals sitting here, you all think you're separate, but you're not. Back through time, all of your substance physically hooks in to each other, through your parents and going on back, physical cells, physically in contact with one another back a long time, and it ties you into the trees outside, into the worms in the ground, one living organism on Earth. Um, there is the argument, of course, that life was created in the Garden of Eden. We all know the, the Christian story, and that, of course, there was a, a moment. Oh, well, this is not working, so you may have to advance it. I'll try it again. No. Nope. Try it again. Well, is there something up there? No. Ah, okay. Try it again. Yes, there it is. At any rate, in comes the apple, and we know what it is. And that was supposed to be the beginning of the introduction of death in the world. Um, Adam, unfortunately, ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge, and they were chucked out of the Garden of Eden. Um, the reality, no, this is not working. Oh, here it is. The reality is that, as I say, I don't think anything can possibly die on Earth. And I'm really, I'm not giving you a spin story here. I'm telling you what I really believe as a biologist and what I'm teaching is that there is no such thing as death. Everything that has ever lived is still alive back along that fourth dimension. Um, let's skip through this a little quicker if it does. Suffice it to say, this is the way we tend to perceive life, most of us do. We see it as all pieces, isolated chunks, um, even the moment when we create new life. Um, all of this is isolated bits, and in the reality, it's not. 
It's all physically connected. It's all tied together, but it requires you to see everything in the four dimensions in which it all exists, length, width, height, and time. And if we could perceive that dimension, we would see the single, the unity of life. And if you understand that, then you'd realize there can be no death. At any rate, I'll move forward through this fairly quickly here. This is the bio blob. You know, what does it look like? It has a moment in time when life begins on planet Earth three and a half billion years ago, however that may have happened, and we'll be talking about that. And then that symbol organism starts diversifying through time and space, responding to different challenges, becoming differently shaped in its various extremities. Um, but within that organism, there can be no death. Death is an illusion of limited vision. Uh, here's another way of looking at it, starting at the bottom. You have the beginning of life, and then life branches through time, like a gigantic four-dimensional amoeba. Um, all kinds of things start to change. That little plane at the top is the way we see things. We think everything is separate, and it's not. Back down that fourth dimension, it's all tied together as a single organism. No death. Immortality is natural to life. Um, even extinction. It's a thing we bandy around all the time. The reality extinction is nothing more than the failure of part of this organism to continue expanding through space and time. So even extinction doesn't occur in that sense. And what are fossils? Fossils, come back to that. Fo what are fossils? Fossils are the dandruff of life. They're, they're my bread and butter. I spend all my day and night dreaming about wonderful fossils. I spent 40 years working in the Riversley World Heritage Area, digging up the ancestors of the koalas and kangaroos. And this is the dandruff of the bio blob. It's the bits that get discarded as this organism is moving through space and time. And yet it tells us what the organism was like at various points back through time. So we use fossils to interpret how life has been changing through time. So evolution is what is the driving force that makes all of this happen. And I think I'll, I'll stop with this point that I think when we talk about evolution, we're really talking about two things. One is the origin of life from non-life. That's a very big question. How do we get a living organism, the bio blob in the first place, out of the dust of the earth? And the second question is, once you've got it, how does it change its form through space and time? How does one part of it become something else later in time? And that's what we'll be talking about. Thank you very much. The, the, the dandruff of the bio blob. I think Absolute. if I get nothing else out of tonight, I'll definitely remember that. Um, I have to say, uh, I th who was the guy who did Scientology? Is a very strange lad. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard? L. Ron Hubbard. And he did say, if you want to get rich, invent a religion. So I'm, invent <laughs> I'm, I'm inventing bio blobology, and I'm happy to get anybody to sign up. Yes, we'll, we'll have a, a book at the door if you want to sign up. Um, Abram. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. I just want to say what a privilege and honor it is to be um, in dialogue with such esteemed guests, um, Professor Michael Archer and Father Doro Kustash. Um, they've spent a lot of their life um, doing really formal, formal qualification, formal teaching in this area, and they're much more qualified than I am to speak on these issues. I'm, I'm talking in a more layman's, uh, layman's interest in these sorts of things, but uh, hopefully I can uh, live up to... Uh, their, their high, ex high standards that they set for us today. Um, so I'm just going to go through a, a brief uh, summary of what my position is on, um, on evolution and how it relates to Christianity. And basically my, my, um, my summary is I just wanted to have a quick, quick definition of what we're talking about here when we, when we talk about evolution. So there's, evolution can be a word that's quite um, quite difficult to pin down in terms of what it means. And um, from my perspective, I've kind of narrowed it down to about three different um, three different categories. The first thing is basically just called um, evolution or microevolution, and it's a sort of the general um, definition that Ragai was talking about um, earlier. And it's just this, the general sense in which things change and develop over time. And I think in this um, in this sort of respect, no one really has any um, issues with evolution. Even young earth creationists believe that when God um, miraculously created certain creatures, they evolve within their kinds. So he created, say, for example, the original a dog, and then um, over the periods of thousands of years, dogs have uh, you know, evolved and created different types of breeds of dogs, and they're all different shapes and sizes and so forth. And so in that respect, the general sense of evolution in that sense is quite uncontroversial. The second um, aspect of evolution is um, 
what is basically known as macroevolution or maybe more accurately the thesis of common ancestry, which basically says that everything on this life, everything, sorry, every living thing on, on the earth, um, as Professor Archer was saying, um, is part of the bio blob. <laughs> um, everything is traceable back to one um, original common ancestor. So if you take everyone and you kind of map out according to time and according to the, their geography, eventually you'll reach back to a single organism where everything derives from. Um, and even in this sort of, even in this, this is the, the, the part where a lot of young earth creationists and um, even old earth creationists begin to part company with, um, with, uh, with uh, other theorists basically and they say that um, God actually miraculously created things along the way that they were not actually um, coming from each other. They haven't physically evolved one aspect to another, they were miraculously created along certain parts of the way. Um, but from my perspective um, on this issue, I, I don't take too much issue with the um, with the aspect of macroevolution. I'm happy to I'm happy to concede um, that uh, basically everything does evolve from a, a common ancestor. The issue where I where, that I have with is the third aspect of evolution, which is known as Darwinism, and that is basically saying that um, given that original life form and from the time period of the original life form to the time period that we have today, there was a transition period and the mechanisms that explain that transition of how that single um, original organism moved from being a tiny cell to all the complexity of life today was through the process of natural selection and random mutations. And that's the issue that I have with. I th um, just looking at the biological evidence, looking at um, the great diversity and complexity of life, the, the you know the amazing uh, things that we see inside cells and DNA, all the machinery. I just find it quite hard and quite difficult to um, believe that these sorts of things can happen on a natural basis given the time period that we have. So I think the evidence for Darwinian uh, evolution, um, in the sense of the evidence for random mutations and natural selection, is quite limited. And um, I'm hoping today that um, Professor Archer can give us some specific examples and some strong evidence um, about how the mechanisms of natural selection and random mutation can um, generate this amount of biological complexity in, that sh in such a short spirit, uh, space of time, um, speaking uh, in, in that such a short period of time. And um, you hear it bandied around all the time, evolution is a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact, and um, you know, I'm happy to accept that it would be a fact. Uh, I just need to see the evidence for it as well. Um, I've got no um, theological objections to Darwinism, it's mostly scientific. I mean, it can be perfectly consistent with, um, with, with Christianity for there to be a natural process of evolution, um, and, and it could be um, consistent with Christianity that God could have superintended the process of evolution, guided it along the way to create the certain aspects of um, certain creatures that we see today. So the issue is the Christian can be quite open to the evidence because either way there's a, a coherent explanation that fits in with the worldview. So what we need to see is basically the evidence that um, occurred this way or that way. Um, so just to kind of uh, go through, we'll go through all of these um, I'll bring up these slides a little bit uh, a little bit later on, just because we don't have too much time at the moment. But as as the we might just have come up, one more minute if we could. One more minute, yeah. So um, as 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 the topics come up, we'll um, we'll bring up these sorts of slides. We're talking more in a theological aspect right now. Um, so sorry, I'm just clicking through. This was a, a PowerPoint presentation from a few years ago. So the Christian. Um, interpretation of Genesis obviously becomes quite quite important in this aspect because we are talking about the interrelationship between Christianity and and, and um, Christianity and evolution and so from my perspective I, I interpret um, I interpret the uh, early Genesis um, as, as a type of um, metaphorical slash historical approach there are some historical aspects to the narrative as well but um, it shouldn't be pressed to for literality in terms of the sequence of events or to press it down for a time period of events and I've got a lot of reasons for thinking that and um, they're all listed in the presentation and we can discuss that um, as the questions come through um, throughout the night and in, in the discussion between the panelists but um, I'm enjoying I'm going to enjoy this uh, conversation tonight and hopefully you guys enjoy it as well. Thank you. Abraham. De definitely the question of how the Genesis account of creation fits in with 
modern theories is a question we want to come back to. But before we do that, um, we'll go over to uh, Father Doru um, for his point of view. Mm-hmm. Good evening. How does it work? Oh, okay. So bad. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I was very, uh, I don't know, uh, anxious about this, uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, in the past, I uh, used to go to many such uh, gatherings, and uh, uh, I thank God uh, um, there isn't uh, much of a contention around here. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I have to explain why I'm here. Uh, It's because uh, this panel is about creation and evolution. It's not about creationism and evolutionism. Um, I don't believe that uh, the doctrine of creation has anything to do with uh, the so-called creationist science. And I dare say, uh, I don't believe that the theory of evolution has anything to do with uh, evolutionism. Uh, Let me explain. The doctrine of creation, uh, which is uh, one of the fundamentals of of the Christian faith, um, is a theological representation of reality. In other words, it looks at things from the viewpoint of God. And the most characteristic question for uh, the doctrine of creation is, who? And since uh, we have been... uh, heard uh, already about uh, uh, the book of Genesis, Um, I uh, remind you of the first line in Genesis, uh, which uh, is about God and about what God did, uh, not about how God did things. This is why I uh, personally uh, believe that as a Christian I don't need creationism at all, uh, which is a kind of... uh, scientific or pseudo-scientific form of uh, explaining reality Um, because uh, perhaps if you look at my slide it answers to the same question how which uh, is also posed by evolutionism Uh, the difference between creationism and evolutionism is the fact that they give very different answers to uh, the same question how and uh, those different answers uh, derive from their very uh, different ideological backgrounds. Uh, for a theologian, this is a very simple uh, story, uh, um, actually, um, because supernaturalism and naturalism uh, are, at least in the Orthodox tradition, uh, two pseudomorphoses. May I use this word? Uh, in other words, errors. There have uh, have been uh, many disputes in the Middle Ages, particularly in the West, uh, opposing naturalists and supernaturalists. Uh, I don't know how uh, this uh, very Western medieval topic crept into the Orthodox tradition so that we uh, find ourselves from time to time, these days particularly, uh, upholding one or the other of the two Western ideologies. Um, So, uh, creationism and evolutionism are ideological standpoints. They don't have anything to do with faith or non-faith. Politics, if you like. Um, On the other hand, evolution, the theory of evolution, uh, is a scientific description of reality. For instance, uh, whether or not uh, there is such a thing as the bio blob, yeah? Uh, That's something that the science uh, has to grapple with, but uh, I'm free of this kind of concern as a Christian. At least that's my interpretation, my understanding of things. Um, So, is there any way in which creationism and evolutionism uh, be bridged, Uh, can be bridged? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I repeat, these are two very different 
ideological standpoints, uh, and if anyone has to uh, sort out things in relation to these two ideologies, one naturalist and the other one supernaturalist, uh, one should dig up seriously uh, the cultural layers of uh, the Western Middle Ages. Could creation and evolution be bridged? I believe they can. And let me explain. In my view, uh, the theory of evolution and the doctrine of creation are two very different viewpoints on the same reality. There's a theological viewpoint and there's the scientific viewpoint. And because uh, the theological viewpoint answers a different question from the scientific viewpoint, um, definitely uh, the two viewpoints will be different. Uh, but do different perceptions mean one should be erroneous and the other one uh, uh, correct? Um, I am a fan of transdisciplinarity, which is a very interesting philosophical construct of our uh, times. And in transdisciplinarity, uh, there's this idea of levels of reality and corresponding levels of perception. For instance, um, let's take biology. Um, that's a level of reality. You know? It cannot be reduced to uh, the anorganic, so to speak. Yeah? Um, and w one like me, who is not a trained uh, biologist, has nothing to say about biology. And I have nothing to say about all those interesting questions that uh, uh, are threatening the horizon. Um, but can a biologist say anything significant in relation to, th uh, to theology? Uh, that's a very different level of reality. And that's a very different level of perception. Different questions. Yeah? Uh, whether or not a biologist uh, acknowledges the who, that's a different story, but not a scientific uh, story. This is why, for instance, um, our uh, friend uh, Dawkins uh, cannot be right uh, when he says there's evolution, therefore there's no God. Yeah? That's not science. That's ideology. Um, and let me exemplify this um, uh, to... Just have one minute to go. One minute? Oh, my God. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to a lot of these issues. Okay. okay. Uh, let me exemplify this um, uh, to perception or to perspective uh, viewpoint. Uh, a saint from uh, the fourth century, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, uh, in his apology uh, for the Exaimeron, the Exaimeron, uh, the six days of creation, as interpreted by Saint Basil the Great, uh, pointed out the fact that uh, the first chapter of Genesis uh, refers to two stories in the same chapter one of Genesis. One is from the viewpoint of God, and it's summarized by the first verse, when creation, or reality, if you like, created reality is one event, but that's the viewpoint of God, and the human perspective, uh, which is uh, uh, displayed in the so-called days of creation, uh, where there's many events. And Gregory says, well, uh, neither is complete. They both stand together or fall together. Um, should I go for one more? There you go. It looks um, like a pretty picture. We'll make this the last one. That's <laughs> actually my, uh, 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 whatever, my, my solution, which is um, Christian and doctrinal. Uh, what's uh, there in the, in the center? It's a representation, a schematic representation of Christ. The mystery of Christ, according to um, uh, the Christian tradition, is complex. Uh, you see uh, uh, the upper hemisphere, uh, DH, uh, that's divine human. Yeah? Christ is God and a human being. Uh, what you see uh, at the bottom, um, with the two uh, quarters, D and H, sep uh, separate, that's Christ's divinity and Christ's humanity. Um, in um, uh, traditional Christology, in other words, the doctrine of Christ, uh, although we can distinguish between his uh, divinity and his humanity, uh, and 
although in theory we can distinguish between his divine activity and his human activity, in reality, we don't know Christ according to a schema. We know Christ as a person. When we pray, we don't say, the divinity of Jesus, help me. We say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah? Um, and in other words, when we refer to Christ, uh, we refer to that divine human uh, person who operates always divine humanly. In other words, in synergy. As I said there, the principle of synergy. Well, for me, this is um, uh, the most uh, simple, basic, uh, faith-based, if you like, uh, uh, wisdom that can lead us to understanding that there's no either creation or evolution. It's both. Why? Because creation is the viewpoint uh, of theology or the viewpoint of the faith, and it identifies the activity of God in the universe, whereas evolution is a naturalist vo uh, viewpoint uh, which explores um, let's say, natural or cosmic energies at work in the universe. Um, a complete act of knowledge would, uh, I guess, uh, would uh, ask uh, for us to bring together these perspectives, but without synthesizing them, without confusing them. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. So, um, if I can start by just asking a question about um, what you've just said, Father Doru, which is, um, are, are you basically saying then that faith tells us that God created the universe, but then faith should not go further to try to tell us how he did it? Science tells us how the universe comes about, but it has nothing to say about whether God is behind it or not. Is that a fair summary of, yeah. of what yeah, you're that, saying? That's pre pretty much it, Father. Uh, and uh, uh, I believe that uh, any scientist uh, that uh, has anything to say as a scientist about the who uh, doesn't do science. Sure. So, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've got to second that with grand enthusiasm. Um, and we do teach students that. Well, one of, the, one of the traps for students coming into science is somehow they think... They're going to learn about truths of the universe. They're going to learn um, absolute laws and things like that. The reality is science knows nothing about truths. Um, Popper, one of the grand philosophies of our time, said the distinction between the ideas that are the stuff of science and those that are any other kind of ideas, which could be theology or whatever, is that no idea in science can ever be proven you can falsify it, you can show that the idea that you're putting forward is wrong, but you can never say you've proved something. It always stays vulnerable. Every single thing that is put up in science is vulnerable to testing forever. Um, in the case of the, which, which I guess is where we come to the same point, that it's, it's a different universe of ideas, a way of thinking, whereas in theology you get revealed truths. And you can accept the truths because they're revealed in, in a holy text or whatever, or your own faith. So truths are part of theology. They are not part of science. And I agree with you completely. Any scientist who says that they have somehow scientifically proven that God doesn't exist should be summarily run out of the universities, put up against a wall, and smacked with a wet cucumber. Because science can have nothing to say about the existence or non-existence of gods. I think all we can say is that in our understanding of the processes, the, the how that um, life came into being or the how the university came into being, we don't see increasingly a need for a supernatural component in the how process. But that doesn't mean it wasn't there. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there in the beginning in the theistic evolutionary model, um, that it was an inspiration or a, a process that was started by a god, science can never have anything to say about that. So I think we're not in disagreement about that point yeah. at all. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, one other um, uh, hero of our times, Hawking, you know, the wheelchair mm -hmm. guy, uh, uh, tr try to, well, 
he, he's, he's a sweet man, actually. Uh, 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 he, he tried at some point in, in his bestseller, uh, Short History of Time, uh, he, he tried to uh, uh, speak about God, and there's a lot of God in, uh, in that book. Uh, but but uh, it's, a, it's a very limited God, or a God who, who, who has very limited options. Uh, everything that uh, God could do uh, in terms of his uh, omnipotence, uh, almightiness, um, well, happened before the Big Bang. Uh, there was nothing to do <laughs> for this God afterwards, uh, which is uh, actually uh, uh, a, a, a viewpoint that, uh, again, is philosophically grounded. It has nothing to do with, with any science. Um, my, my solution, which, sorry, I, I had to rush it a bit, although I don't speak too quickly. Um, uh, my solution is, is actually uh, of a mystical sort. Uh, what I try to say, just a second, what I try to say is the fact that uh, what you contemplate, for instance, uh, in science, what you contemplate uh, as uh, the phenomenon of evolution, uh, this uh, chain of life that is unbroken, I love the metaphor, um, can have more ingredients uh, in the background than uh, what, uh, for instance, a scientist uh, is equipped to recognize, to acknowledge. Sure. So, um, and that science has no business saying that that is impossible. All science does is deal with the physical, examinable, testable components of the world that it sees and can interact with. We cannot test the existence of God. So that will always remain as a viable option, and therefore um, they're not incompatible concepts. So before we go into the, the role of God, which I think we need to come back to, but before we do that, can we first dive a little bit into the mechanics of evolution and some of the scientific issues that Abraham was raising earlier? Because I think that they're often one of the big obstacles to um, you know, understanding the point of view. We, we seem to be getting a lot more agreement tonight than we were expecting, which is good in a way, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. Um, but let's see if we can get some disagreement happening as well, <laughs> just for fun. So, um, you know, Father Doru made the distinction between the how and the who. So let's just focus on the how for a minute. So um, one, of the, one of the interpretations of the creation account in the book of Genesis is that God created different kinds, you know, capital K kinds of animals. So you had maybe the mammals and the fish and the birds, and that they're, um, they're, they can't, you can't move from the one to the other. And I think Abraham was raising earlier the problems that might be inherent in how that might happen. So I think that's something. Can we explore that for a little while? How do you go from um, an amoeba to a chimpanzee, for example? There seems to be a huge jump there. Can we shed any light on how that might happen? And I'm sure Abraham maybe has some objections that he might want to raise. Let's, let's dive into that for a little while. Do you want to start with the objections? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you should put the case forward first, and then we can do it. Right. <laughs> I will. I had it was my great privilege actually to be involved in my first evolution creation debate with uh, somebody you may have heard of, Dwayne T. Gish, Dr. Dwayne T. Gish, biochemist, PhD. Um, he's he's gone now, but he was regarded by the Americans, the creation science movement, to be the best spokesperson for the creationist point of view. And he published lots of books. One of them, the famous one, was Fossils or Evolution, the Fossils Say No. And in this book he said that if somebody could demonstrate um, intermediate links, missing links, that tied the created kinds that were noted in the Bible together, in other words, thread together two of the created kinds to show that one came from the other, he would believe in evolution. In my debate, I thought I'd rub my hands with glee, and I thought I've got you, you know, before this debate started. And um, after he got done doing his presentation, I mentioned this transition between reptiles and mammals. Now, you, we all sit here. I'm yammering away using two bones in my head, the dentary bone and the squamosal bone, and that's our jaw articulation. Every mammal in the world for the last 200 million years has hinged its jaw that way. Every lizard and snake and crocodile out there articulates their jaw with two different bones. They quadrate and they articulate. It's completely different. And Gish appropriately said, how could you possibly transition from one type to another? You'd have to unhinge the jaw and say, would you guys wait there for a while? 
while you rearrange it with a different set of bones and say, ha ha, I give you mammal. Um, and of course he'd laugh at this and say, oh, it's ridiculous. Well, the fossil record, Dr. Gish, I pointed out to him, actually says yes. And in South America and in Africa, fossils have been found that are about 200 million years old. They're at the transition time, the, old, the earliest mammals we know about. They have two jaw articulation systems. They have the beginning squamosal dentary jaw articulation of the evolving mammal jaw set. And inside is the articular quadrate of the reptile getting smaller and smaller. So they have two systems. That's how they transitioned from reptiles to mammals. And those missing links exist. They're studied exhaustively. And what happened to that reptilian jaw articulation? You're hearing me blither with it right now. It's the hammer and the anvil in our middle ear. It's those two bones that were added to the mammalian middle ear that still are there, hinging away as they were in the old reptile jaw system, but now all they're doing is helping to transmit sound, but they're still right there, just inside your jaw. The system is brilliant. Embryology tells you the same thing. You can see in the evolution of mammals in, in, uh, in embryo, in utero, you can watch this transition taking place. Our marsupials in Australia are born so young that the dentary and squamosal bone are not formed when they come out of the mother's cloaca, like a little baby bandicoot. And in fact, when it first opens its mouth to take a teat in the pouch of the mother bandicoot's abdomen area, it does it by hinging it on the hammer and anvil. It's those two bones of the reptilian jaw that enable it to open its mouth for the first time. Then when it's got a hold of the teat, it takes in nutrients, the dentary squamosal bone continued to grow, and the second time in its life, when it opens its mouth, it does it like a mammal with the, the squamosal dentary bonds. So it's brilliant. And I presented this to Dwayne T. Gish, and I said, you know, the South American animal is called Probenignathus. I gave him all the details. And I could see him madly, because we were both up on the stage, summing through his little box of cards. You know, how do I answer these crazy evolutionists when they come up with strange ideas? And he couldn't find a card for Pro Ben Ignatius. And he said, I'll get back to you on that one. And then skipped off onto another topic. So. <laughs> Did I win my point? I don't know. But we do have missing links between the created kinds, and they're coming up all the time in the fossil record. Well, we're not going to let Abram skip away to something else. What would you like to respond? Um, so this is this is the problem that I have with um, discussing things with um, evolutionary like people that come to do, to approach evolution from an atheistic perspective. So from my understanding, Father asked the question of how um, things go from one to another, not the fact that things do move uh, that you have evidence of things moving from one to another. So the question is the mechanism. It's not the fact that things did or didn't move from one to the other. I'm happy to say that there are these so-called missing links and things progress from one thing to the other. The question is what's the mechanism behind that? Did there need to be intelligent um, actions to guide the genetic process or could this have happened through naturalistic processes like um, Darwinianism, like random mutation and natural selection? And I think from our experience, um, basically all the evidence that we have is basically says that Darwinism, in terms of the, 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 the processes of random mutation and natural selection, are quite limited in they can't produce new complex genetic systems, new processes, new proteins. There's been no studies that have shown that the, um, just by using natural processes that there's an increase in surge of complexity, in surge of new information. Um, say, for example, the, one of the issues is one, one, one such example is um, the human war with malaria. Um, as you guys are aware, there's, um, uh, malaria is a, a, a basically a disease that's in, transmitted by a mosquito into the human into the human cells, into the human body, and basically um, there's enormous selective pressure. Um, for humans to develop some sort of resistance against malaria. It's killed thousands and killed millions of people over the, over the centuries. Um, and basically, uh, ever since the advent of modern medicine, humans have been developing drugs and um, been developing antibiotics to try to kill the bacteria. And the bacteria keeps, uh, keeps basically evolving, keeps changing, keeps developing resistance to the, um, to the, uh, to the antibiotics. And that's hailed by um, the evolutionist is a great example of how Darwinian evolution is in process. Um, and the reason that that is possible is because 
Darwinian evolution can easily explain why there's single point mutations can occur that give um, the bacteria resistance. But um, in, there's also a genetic um, trait in human beings called sickle cell hemoglobin, which the body has developed um, in, in order to combat this. In order to combat this, and in all of the years that humans have been having this war with malaria and other um, other creatures have been having this war with malaria, malaria has never been able to overcome sickle cell hemoglobin because it would require multiple um, simultaneous mutations to occur, and just the chances of that are happening are so improbable. So basically, the question is, where is like the evidence of like I've just given a, an example of over over thousands of years and over millions of cells, there's quite limited evidence to suggest that there's anything that can um, develop whole new functional systems, whole new proteins. I mean, we know how complicated the cell is. Um, basically, there's like proteins, which is basically machines, miniature machines. The, the cell itself is like a miniature factory operating. And the question is, how can you get this miniature factory just by chance or just by random assort assorting of, um, of chemicals? The question is, where is the natural process um, coming to, uh, basically, where's the natural evidence for that? From a theistic perspective, it's, it's quite easy to understand, given the fact that DNA is like an information-based system. It's like genetic code, and we always know that information Information comes from intelligence. Um, if you were to see, you know, something handwritten in the sky, you know, um, John loves Mary, or so forth, you would know immediately that's a sign of an intelligent being because there's information there, and we know that there's information in the cells. So basically, my, the, the claim is. It's, it's quite intuitive for, for um, someone to see information in DNA and think, look, there's a signature um, of the creator uh, in the cells. But the, 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 the evolutionary, the atheistic person, is trying to explain this um, on a naturalistic perspective. And the question is, how is that possible? Where's the, where, where's the evidence of that occurring? There's a lot of stuff in that yeah, challenge. Yeah. Can, can I focus you on one particular issue, which I think gets to the heart of what Abraham is saying, which is that um, the probability question. So it seems that to go from one complex state to another complex state that's quite different to the first one, you need a lot of changes in the genetic code. Like there are a lot of differences in the two genetic codes. And if they all have to happen by chance and they all have to coincide, the chances of that happening you know, multiply as you increase the number of changes that you need. So is there a mechanism? Is there some way to...? Yeah, sure. And, and of course you're right. Um, in every one of us there are mutations. There will be thousands of, of novel mutations in all of our genomes as we sit here. Little errors in DNA replication. But in most cases it doesn't matter. Let's go back to the hemoglobin example that you gave, which is a good one. Sickle cell anemia is one mutant version of the hemoglobin molecule. And it does prefer some uh, some protection for the individual that has it from malaria. Uh, individuals that don't have that particular mutation are more susceptible to malaria. And in fact, I would have to say, there, we're probably sitting here because of so many diseases like that that gradually we have gotten on top of. Um, when you think about many peoples around the world who have had first contact with Europeans, like when um, smallpox first was introduced to some of the islanders and the Pacific Islanders, it was nearly 100% obliteration, much higher rates of death associated with this because those people had not had the chance to have their antibody systems evolving to develop um, some or, or total protection against some of these diseases. Um, the protection against diseases is a gradual process. We find with time, we do get over it. Some people now are surviving without any symptoms from HIV. Gradually, that will become, I would think, it may take a, another 50 or 100 years, as relatively unimportant to us as the common cold, which probably killed us when it first happened. Flus used to kill us all the time. We're gradually developing immunities against this, and those people who survive go on to reproduce in a classic Darwinian sense. But to answer your question, Antonios, um, I guess... It's true for some kinds of, of modifications where you're looking at this bio blob and you suddenly see one portion of the bio blob um, becoming something very significantly different looking. And you say, how did that happen? Did it just happen with a steady accumulation of single point mutations, eliminating anything that didn't work, but just picking up on the ones that did? Well, it isn't always necessarily the case that that's the way it works. There, there's been a lot of research done over the last decade or so in things called Hox genes, for example. These are controlling genes, single mutations that can change a rate-controlling gene 
that can profoundly change the body form of an organism. For example, if one mutation in a Hox gene in a crustacean actually went from a 10-legged animal when the mutation occurred to a six-legged one. In other words, transformed a crustacean into an insect. And it was one single mutation did that. So some gene mutations have very big effects across the whole genome and can cause profound transitions in the morphology of an organism. It's a balance. Most mutations are single-point mutations. Most are either neutral or, or negative. In the case of hemoglobin, there are 200 mutant versions of the hemoglobin molecule in humans, 200. And for 199 of those, it doesn't make any difference at all. The one that does is the sickle cell anemia. And the reason for that is the hemoglobin molecule is a gigantic molecule. It's in all of us. But in that molecule is a little piece called the heme group. The heme group is what bonds oxygen and carts it around your body. As long as that doesn't suffer a mutation, the rest of the molecule can become radically different, and it'll still do the job. And that's why there are so many mutant varieties of hemoglobin in all of human beings. So most of these mutations are neutral. They don't make any difference. But something might change in the environment. Some particular mutation might confer an advantage, like sickle cell anemia for malaria and suddenly that becomes the, the mutation of the day, celebrated by the organism that has it, and they go on to produce more young. So both things happen. Yes, you get mutations. Um, mostly it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's actually negative, gets chopped out, and sometimes it works. And sometimes one of those mutations can have a massive increase in the, the change of the body. Our own faces, for example, our short faces. We don't have muzzles, which is kind of curious. All the other primates tend to have muzzles. We don't. And there's one, one mutation in a rate-controlling gene that results in what's called neoteny, producing adults that become sexually mature in a baby's body form. You think of axolotls, you know, those uh, things you can buy in the pet shops. They're actually salamanders that are sexually reproductive as babies. They don't metamorphose as a frog or as a tadpole would to become a frog. Normally salamanders, like an axolotl, metamorphose and become a land-based salamander. They don't. One mutation has caused that axolotl to reproduce as a baby, completely different body form, and suddenly you're off in another direction. And it's not hard. And in fact, if you have an axolotl and you want to know how easy it is to transform that massively different body form, if you know a friend who has one, and I don't recommend this because they'll hate you forever, take one tiny drop of iodine and put it into the tank with the axolotl, and when the people come back, they discover they've got a salamander in their tank. It'll, it's that simple. One little transition of a chemical can cause a huge change in the body form of the animal. Oh, so did you want a, a quick response? Yeah, so um, basically the majority of the examples that you've given there have basically it's, it's, it's things losing um, their complexity. It's not an example of how new information and new processes have come forth. Um, for example, the, 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 the Hox genes that you were referring to, um, you would agree that the majority of mutations that do occur are single point mutations, and then the majority of any mutations are either neutral or detrimental. Um, and then the, the tiny the tiny proportions um, the tiny proportions of mutations that do end up being beneficial are actually loss of genomes loss of uh, loss of uh, for example um, uh, a lot of the mutations that you were talking about that um, have some sort of benefits in like the 200 mutations in, in malaria in the, in the anemia sorry um, a lot of them are lose the ones that confer um, uh, resistance or benefit to the organisms are involved loss of information. Um, and even in experiments where there's been replications of generations of E. coli, for example, um, trying to confer a benefit is when they, the gene, the, the bacteria itself loses um, its information. So like, what, what are the specific examples of when, when things have, um, when there have been mutations that have led to increases in complexity and increases in systems. That's what I'm trying oh, to get at. Yeah, I'm afraid there are actually plenty. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways in which this can happen is you often get a massive replication of big sections of the DNA. Part of the DNA still does its job in whatever it was in fact originally useful for. You won't find this in there, I'll bet. But some of the other DNA, the duplicated sections, suddenly are free to undergo mutations that have no relevance to the organism, and in the course of exploring changing one base pair in that genome or in that uh, DNA molecule for another, 
Um, it, it's spontaneously creating new, it's exploring new combinations of base pairs in the, in the DNA molecule. Um, and it, it might hit on something big, and all of a sudden you've got another option there. Um, there's plenty of examples. In that whole argument about intelligent design, so many silly arguments were put up about that to try to explain uh, that life is just too complex to be yeah. able to evolve and explain itself um, through natural evolutionary processes. But in fact, as you start to explore all those examples that have been put forward to justify intelligent design, which is really nothing more or less than creationism in a tuxedo, it's the same stuff. Um, in reality, you find lots of intermediate conditions um, that the, the uh, uh, intelligent design people didn't seem to be aware of that function in different ways. Um, this is a fascinating question, like the whole issue of, of uh, flagella in some of the um, protistins, the little whippy little hairs on some of the free-living cells like euglenas and things like that. Um, everyone said, that's so complex, how could that evolve? And then they found there are internal organs within some of those single-cell organisms that have most of the structures of the flagellum, and they're used actually to shoot darts out to harpoon other kinds of organisms, microorganisms, under the microscope. Um, and that these have been co-opted into the side of the body, and they're mobile, and all of a sudden you've got a flagellum. Um, uh, can, can I just move on? Yeah. I, I, you brought up the intelligent design movement. Uh, and I want to come back to something Father Doru was saying earlier about the distinction between um, sort of the science and the faith. So in, the proponents of intelligent design, I think, see what they're doing as science. So I was just wondering if I could get a very quick opinion from each of the three panelists whether you see what they're doing as fitting under science, um, is it a scientific approach, or is it more of a faith approach? Perhaps we can start with uh, Father Doru. Father, I, J just I, a very quick idea before we move yeah, on to the sorry, next one. Uh, they had 20 minutes of uh, things that I didn't understand. <laughs> uh, so I'd rather want to go back to my slides, please, Facebook. Um, the next slide after my uh, schema, so that you understand. Yeah, uh, the next one, please, so that we understand where I stand. Um, you may have to use this. Yeah, it's fine. It, it's all good. I, I won't be going beyond this. Um, uh, the fact that you uh, laughed when I said what I said uh, uh, shows that uh, you are in agreement with me. Um, fine lessons. But as I said, I, I, I'm not a biologist. And this is a conversation between two kinds of science, science and creationism. So, yeah? so you're saying that in, uh, intelligent it's, design is a kind of science, not a kind of fact? No, no, I, 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 I was uh, trying to bring a different perspective in relation to the first point. I'm not about intelligent anything. Yeah, so I, I try to summarize how I felt during the 20 minutes of uh, biological duel. Um, okay, I'm a Christian. My faith has nothing to do with that conversation, which can be accurate or not. I have no way in which I can test the veracity, the accuracy of that kind of information. Nothing whatsoever. My biology classes in primary or whatever, whenever it happened, don't help, okay? So this is where you lost me, and actually I, I, I have to say that I told Father Antonius that after seeing those questions that I didn't see why I have to be here, and I still don't see why. We have some more questions to come. Mm, can I, yeah. can I, can I just a, question a second. Come? Just can a second. I, just a second. You had 20 minutes of duel. I just yeah. to ask no, no, no. You had 20 minutes of duel. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I'm Christian. I look at things from the viewpoint of my faith. Yeah? The question is, is my faith affected by this kind of uh, controversy here? Biology this, biology does, genetic this, genetic that. Is my faith affected in any way? Well, mine isn't. That's what I try to say. And I'm a priest. Yeah? Uh, and what you see on the slide there is my actual answer. 
when uh, the priest offers to God in the liturgy, in the Eucharist, the gifts of the congregation, the bread and the wine, the, that's the line that the priest says, at least in my Eastern Orthodox tradition, your own from your own we offer you in every way and for everything. The priest offers to God this gift, this sacrifice, bread and wine. In that uh, bread and wine, there's everything, life, the universe, everything. It's there recapitulated, summarized. That's my only concern as a Christian. What do I do with the things that are? I'm not concerned as to how things have come to be as they are. That's a scientific question. That's the what and that's the how. I'm not interested. And on this note, I have to apologize, but I'm not a biologist. I cannot be part of the panel. I'll be uh, sitting next to my wife. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, for as long as, as I can endure, uh, I'll uh, endure. Uh, but please forgive me. I, I, yeah. I cannot uh, uh, participate anymore. That's right. We went through, that was the technical part of the night. Now oh. we're moving on to the, some other issues. Uh, and, and I want to, going on um, from what you're asking, um, you, it's a lovely way to put it, Father. I, I love the way that you're describing it. Um, but I want to ask a few specifics. I'm going to really get down to the nitty-gritty of it. Do you feel that it makes any difference whether God just brings the universe into existence and leaves it to follow its natural course forever after that, or whether it's necessary to feel that God intervenes along the way? Um, but as, as I in, give you my does, answer, does it make a difference? The previous slide. Okay, so it, when you... It, it's, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing synergy between divine energies and natural energies in the universe. What we call uh, natural evolution or the natural world uh, or, or nature is actually far more complex from the viewpoint of my faith. Okay. But that's, of course, not something that I would impose on Professor Archer to say, well, uh, when I explain this or that phenomenon, and I love the, the jewel, um, <laughs> Uh, when I explain this or that phenomenon, I need the uh, divine hypothesis. I don't ask them to do that. But from my viewpoint, whatever they discuss here, there's always something else that it's not brought up. So what is I the mean, nature? Just, what is yeah. the nature of the like? What is the nature of um, that synergy? What what? How can uh, let me put it this way? How can we tell the difference between a world that's working without God? and a world that's working in synergy with God. Is but, there anything we could observe that would tell us we, the difference? We have no experience because uh, uh, from the very beginning, from, from our birth as individuals, but from the be beginning of time, things have functioned in a way that only recently we have come to uh, analyze in terms of is it natural or is it supernatural. Uh, what we call either natural or supernatural is both from the viewpoint of my faith. And that Christological uh, schematic shows precisely that, that the way in Christ Jesus we do not make any difference when we pray to him. Uh, I don't say, I, I refer to your divine nature. I refer to your human nature. I refer to the one person that is both. Well, that's my faith. And that's a schematic, if you like. Yeah? That's a schematic that explains how, at least from my viewpoint, how things operate throughout the whole continuum of the universe, the blob and, and all that. All that is uh, permeated by divine energies. So there's no time in which there's no uh, synergetic, uh, whatever, uh, interaction between the divine and natural energies. That, that's my faith. So you're reminding me of something that I once read in C.S. Lewis, where he said we we look in the gospel and we find the story of the five loaves and the two fish and we consider that a miracle that he fed 5000 people from just five loaves but in fact the very you know every day the grain growing and becoming bread that we can eat and feeding the world that in itself is a miracle so is that the kind of blurring between the natural and supernatural that you're talking about that that really we've we've been taught to think in the western world of that distinction, but the reality is everything, in a sense, is supernatural. Everything that is natural 
is actually supernatural if God is behind it. Is that the kind of thing? Well, or, is it, I, or are you thinking something I, different I would, there? I would rec- no, no, well, I would recommend that, uh, at least in the Orthodox tradition, we do away altogether with the categories of natural and supernatural. Yeah? Reality is complex. Reality is complexity. And uh, um, we only have uh, very uh, limited uh, ways in which we uh, peruse reality, in which we uh, grasp reality. And um, uh, the beauty of, uh, of things the way I see it is to bring together that expertise and my faith. So you, so you do think that it, it is important to find a way in which you can uh, integrate uh, spirituality, theology, and the way, and, and science? Yeah, but as I said, I'm a fan of transdisciplinarity where that integration doesn't require, for instance, Professor Archer to become a spiritual person uh, or, a, uh, or a believer. And it doesn't require uh, from me to become uh, a, a biologist or a, a genetician or whatever that is called. Mm. Then, but then in, in, in what sense is it coming at the truth? What truth? Since the sciences, as according to Professor Archer, yes. is the sci- if the sciences don't deal with truth, yeah. you, you want to get to a dogmatic truth that isn't scientific. This is why, for instance, I cannot sympathize with your position. Mm. So, but my question is now: Then, are you saying that there are no truths? What What are the truth? What, what What is your what? position in that in, in, in that aspect? What, you're saying science can't bring us to truth. Are asking me from the viewpoint of your faith or your scientific expertise? It's, it's a straightforward question. No, 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 no. You're asking me as a Christian, a, be... as a believer, or you're asking me as a scientist? I'm asking you as a, a person, Father Dora Kostaki. Kostaki, yeah. Well, uh, I give you the same answer that I have given so far. Um, and can I ask on one more question? To yeah, we're, we're actually, we only have five mi- more minutes in this section, and then we'll um, turn the microphone over to the audience to ask their questions. So I hope you're starting to think of some good questions uh, and getting them ready. Um, yes, go ahead. Abram, you're going to oh, say to, something? To ask the Father. Ask father. Y- yes, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, say whatever. Um, yeah. From your understanding of Genesis, um, is it important to you about, about the historicity or non-historicity of um, Adam and Eve, or not? So say for example... Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve, but uh, you'll, do, you'll not like uh, the clause that I uh, add. <laughs> so we need to hear the clause. Yeah, well, <laughs> Adam, and, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, well, the story in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 is not about the beginning of humankind. It is uh, the beginning of God's people. And the entire scripture, from uh, Genesis to the book of Revelation, is about the history of God's people, not humankind, or the aliens, Martians, and so on and so forth. That, that of course, is quite different to the very literal reading of Genesis, which has become very popular in, popular, in, that's in, the, in word. the modern world. Yes. Can, can I ask, Father, as a patristic scholar, was that literal reading there in the ancient church? Or, and was it the prevalent reading, or were there different readings? Well, uh, it depends on what, uh, what kind of uh, patristic works. Patristic means, uh, that's my field, supposedly. <laughs> uh, means dealing with uh, the, the writings of the church fathers and mothers of the ancient times. Um, um, well, it depends. I'll, I'll give you one example only to see how um, a certain very venerable father of the church could interpret in different ways the same text for different audiences. Saint Ephraim the Syrian, um, mid, uh, say, or first, uh, part, uh, first half of the fourth century, he wrote two uh, commentaries on Genesis. One is a catechetical device, a catechetical tool Talking a to, teaching tool. Yes, yeah. uh, talking to novices, people that were um, beginners in their faith. And that's a very literal, straightforward interpretation of the first chapters of Genesis. Yeah? Uh, in his poetic interpretation of, uh, of the same chapters, you have a very different story. Um, there's nothing literal there. So, uh, same author two different uh, uh, audiences, uses two different genres, 
Uh, where is the truth if we look for some absolute truth? Uh, and the truth is, of course, always out there. Mm. <laughs> yes, I, I would do the X-Files theme, but I don't know how to hum very well. <laughs> So, in other words, if we go back to the ancient church, I've heard it said that the kinds of questions that we're talking about today would in some ways not actually make sense to people in the ancient church. The kinds of questions about what is the truth in the, in the sense that we're thinking about it, um, you know, science in the modern sense that we're thinking about it. Would that have made sense to people 1,500 years ago? I, I think it would have. Like, I'm, I'm actually quite disturbed by this uh, um, kind of on both sides how people like it's kind of that, at least the insinuation of that we can't know the truth or that the truth is somehow um, uh, behind the veil and it's difficult to grasp or difficult to get at. Um, you can, you, it's, it's difficult to say whether or not you can have 100% certainty about things, but you should surely you can have some sort of reasonable certainty about, or, you know, on a practical sense about what can be what can be known and what can't be known. And um, I, I just think that people who try to um, like kind of mystify, mystify the, the, the truth or kind of put it under a different disguise, uh, it's, just, it, it's a view that's kind of self-refuting self, uh, self and it's difficult to... That's why I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the view correctly or, or what it is, but I'm just finding it difficult to grasp. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I? Father? Sorry. Yeah, just, just very briefly. Yes, Have please. you ever read anything from the Church Fathers? Yeah. Any any page? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, do you venerate Saint Maximus the Confessor, or he's one of those from the other side? <laughs> the doors are opening between the two the sides. The doors are open Father. tonight. Okay. Uh, okay. So Saint, Saint Maximus the Confessor, who's uh, 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 my favorite saint and, uh, uh, well, secretly my mentor, so to speak, um, personally. Um, he, he was a very complex person that um, ended up uh, as uh, condemned by the Byzantines, so you must love that. Um, and uh, in uh, his book, uh, usually known as the Ambigua, or the Book of Difficulties, uh, I would um, uh, recommend chapter 10, which is a small treatise in itself. It's about the experiences and the perceptions of the saints. How the saints perceive things. So what was the book? Uh, Ambigua, uh, yeah. or the book of difficulties. How the saints per perceive things. And you'll see there nothing that looks like uh, what you or I can say about our faith. And one example, when he interprets, for instance, the famous passage uh, in uh, Matthew, uh, the synoptics mainly, about Christ's uh, transfiguration on Mount Tabor, uh, uh, he gives no less than nine different interpretations of the same passage. And what's the beauty? He doesn't say which one he prefers. Hmm. But does um, but does 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 Father Maximus, from your perspective, does he think that there was one way in which it happened, or does he think that? No, it's not about the historicity of the event. It's about how the event is perceived. Yeah, that's uh, everything that uh, we tend to forget in the church today. The fact that even when we read the Gospels, we read interpreted history, not history. Hmm. But, okay. but, you, but you do agree that there was a way in which things happened, and um, what we have is uh, a, interpreted a history, interpreted. interpreted history, yeah. theologically interpreted history. And do you think that there is one, there, there is a, a correct and an incorrect way to interpret it? Uh, what has this to do with creation and evolution? You're, you're the one I was bringing it up. Mm, <laughs> no, I, I, I have given you a parable so that you draw some wisdom. <laughs> Okay, I, I think we're going to have to move into the next phase of the night. Um, so we'll leave that question hanging for the moment. Uh, maybe some of our questioners will come back to it. So we have a microphone at the front of the middle aisle here. Um, just for the sake of order, if you have a question, you'll need to come up to the microphone. And um, please feel free to make a line behind Evan. Evan, come, come up. So if you have a question, please come and stand behind him and we'll take the questions one by one. Um, if you're embarrassed to stand up because you're 
unnaturally tall or something like that. Um, please feel free to have a seat until, the, you know, until we're ready for the next question to go ahead. Thank I will you. ask everyone to please, if we can, keep our questions nice and brief so we can get through as many as we can. They are questions, not sermons or lectures, so please keep them nice and to the point. Think very carefully about what you want to ask and put it as clearly as you can. And um, hopefully, we'll, um, well, I'm sure some of them will be more relevant to some of our panelists, but we'll try and apportion it as, as well as we can. Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, firstly, thank you all uh, for being here today. It's awesome to hear you all speak, and I really uh, appreciate the fact that you're all here. Um, I'm actually uh, studying under Father Doru first semester early church fathers, and I told him I'd be here tonight, so I'm saying hello to Father Doru. Um, all right, so the, the thing that uh, I guess is important for myself is that um, we believe as Christians that Christ came for a certain purpose, so that he incarnated to fix something or to heal humanity from something that happened much earlier in history, um, and that there was a, a sin or a separation of man from God that led to a spiritual death and therefore with time a physical death, and that Christ came to fix this problem and incarnated um, to heal our humanity. So that's why for me um, an understanding of the first three chapters of Genesis is important uh, because if man, and this is a question because I'm still learning, I don't uh, suppose to know everything, but I'm trying to learn and grow, but if uh, man is the result of evolution from a prior species, it would mean that there was death in the human chain prior to the first sin, which we believe led to the death of man. So if there was death in this evolutionary process prior to man sinning, then it changes the story a little bit, because why would Christ need to become man to overcome sin, Satan and death? if death was something natural in the process and therefore it changes the whole understanding on, from my perspective of salvation. Okay. And this I, is the I, question, how does that yeah. fit into um, a model? Can, uh, can, I'd, I'd like to hear Father Dora as well because I'm not a biologist, that's hard for me. Um, but how can we uh, bring the two together or do we not bring the two together and how do we interpret ours without the other? Can That's I, can I just sneak a possible biological uh, moment in that? I, if I understand what you're saying is that there's potentially a threat um, to the traditional understanding of the um, existence or the, the creation of sin, as it were, within humans and that therefore need to save humans. If there's a continuity between humans and all other life forms, then how do we, why is it just humans that we're talking about here? Is it possible that this relates to um, ostensibly the issue of free will? And that I, I think I've heard this argument that other animals are maybe driven by instinct and other issues and, and humans with a gigantic brain, which gets them in so much trouble all the time, are capable of making rational or irrational decisions and therefore rejecting, in a biblical sense, reject, rejecting the idea of God and committing sins, and that therefore maybe humans um, in this context would be singularly seen as subject to the ability to commit sins and therefore would be need to be um, resurrected or um, somehow clean to their sins, whereas other animals are acting naturally. Is this possibly one explanation uh, for that? N not really. It can be maybe from one perspective, but from the Christian perspective, uh, death was the consequence of sin. And that's where it gets interesting. Yes, I'd like to hear. because that's the, um, the creation understanding of the Garden of yep. Eden, that death started in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, and if that's not the case, mm -hmm. what, how can we understand it from a Christian perspective? But of course, from a biologist's point of view, death was going on a long time exactly. before Exactly, and that's what so I'm really interested in. That's the problem. In the so, yeah. Yeah. I so, understand that no, is a problem. Um, we'll, we'll throw over to Father okay. if we can. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's uh, other positions on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, our tradition isn't clear at all, contrary to uh, the popular narrative. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, a Pauline, so from St. Paul, a uh, Pauline interpretation of um, uh, the Genesis events uh, in terms of uh, um, the cause of mortality, but even um, 
that famous passage in Romans chapter 5 uh, is really debatable as to what it means. Uh, so I won't be going there. But uh, the popular narrative is that um, uh, we have become mortal because we have sinned. Uh, and uh, the popular narrative uh, goes like uh, there was no death before um, uh, that scene. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't expect Evan to ask this question. Uh, that was a conversation that we had in private, but I see he's uh, very keen to make this public. We won't tell anyone. Okay, that, that's good. Uh, since it's recorded, why not? Um, and, uh, well, I can give you one example uh, of a, f a few, but one that uh, I believe is very respectable uh, here. Uh, Saint Athanasius the Great, uh, Archbishop of Alexandria in the fourth century, um, one of the greatest theologians ever. Uh, he believed that uh, uh, everything that has a beginning of its existence has necessarily an end. In other words, by nature, all things created are mortal. Yeah? All things created are, by nature, mortal. Uh, if you want to check me, uh, against the Gentiles, uh, chapter 41. That's a must in our conversation. All creation is mortal because it has a beginning of its existence. Then, Evan's question was actually uh, very interesting. Uh, what do we make of Christ's salvation? Christ uh, has come to bring us salvation, redemption, healing, restoration, and finally resurrection, immortality. Well, uh, I return to St. Maximus, who is equally venerable for me, uh, who says that uh, what Christ has achieved in history is a modified version of the original divine plan. Uh, God's plan for the creation is to make the creation immortal. That's why I love the bio blob thing. Yeah? So God's plan for the creation is uh, for the creation to become immortal. Yeah? Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, it has to do with our nature. Our nature is deficient, is weak. We have become uh, existent. We have uh, been brought into existence and therefore there was a time when we were not. Because there, there is a time that we were not, we are mortal. Christ's arrival uh, boosts uh, our opportunities, if you like, to become immortal or puts us back on track. Yeah? Uh, the uh, human scene has um, derailed the plan for a while. Yeah? Uh, but the plan remains, um, uh, at least in terms of its target, uh, remains the same. We are destined to immortality. So to be clear, Father, you're saying that it's not that there was a particular act by a particular person that made humanity mortal or capable of dying, but that that was inherent in the nature of humanity, but then that's because the plan for humanity wasn't perfected yet, wasn't completed, and that's what Christ came to do to complete it, basically. Yeah, somehow. It? But yeah. then you have to remember the fact uh, and that's uh, almost uh, faith for me, almost. It's still a hypothesis, but almost faith, uh, that uh, the Bible is about the history of God's people, not the, uh, the history of uh, humankind. Right. And um, uh, I read uh, the, the narrative of chapters two and three in Genesis from the viewpoint of the tradition of the saints uh, who have recognized in Adam and Eve, or the paradisal events, uh, something that is replicated throughout history in the experience of the saints. I have even written an article uh, on Adam's holiness uh, where you'll be finding uh, two Alexandrians, uh, Saint Athanasius and Saint Cyril, uh, who read in the fourth and fifth century, uh, they read uh, Genesis two and three from the viewpoint of the experiences of the saints that they uh, knew at the time. And the experience of Adam and Eve is the experience of any saint with ups and downs. 
Okay, I think we'll move on to the next question. We'll try and cover as many as we can. Yeah. Uh, so my name's Paul. I'll try to keep this brief. I'm studying medicine at the moment. Um, I thought that there was an issue with uh, creation, with the, with the Bible and evolution as a young person, and then growing up I realized that that was not the case, and I came to accept evolution. However, as my studies progress, I doubt evolution perhaps uh, uh, more every day. Uh, I doubt its possibility, and so I have a few questions which I'll try to summarize. Uh, some scientific, some perhaps more theological. Um, does evolution actually meet the criteria for science? So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Popper, Professor, and uh, I, I ask, is evolution falsifiable? Uh, is it experimentally testable in any way, or is it pseudoscientific in the way that um, uh, sort of Freudianism is in that you can always find a different alternative and I guess I'll also add uh, how does it explain the mind and qualia and this is sort of more theological because I think as a scientific theory it doesn't explain how man is more than just a biological machine how how does man um, have what we might call the image of God or free will I think these things are not perhaps well explained by evolution yeah, good questions um, and that is a really key question as to whether or not the, the model of evolution, there isn't actually a theory of evolution. This is an unfortunate term because a theory is that 5% of you will go away tonight and actually think seriously about some of what's been said. That's a theory. And we could technically test it by coming to your homes and asking you whether that happened. But evolution is actually a model and there's thousands and thousands of theories that are involved in it. So we really have to think about it as a broader concept than this. But is it testable? And that's the key thing. Popper said, if it's science, somehow you have to be able to test it. You have to actually technically be able to prove it's wrong in order to qualify as science. If you can't, then you're in a belief system. You know, you accept it on, on its merits for what, what it is, but you don't expect to test it. So can evolution be tested? In three ways it can. One, and it's fascinating, this stuff, and I think your intention was to talk about this a bit, but I guess we didn't quite get there is the experiments have been done on prebiotic simulation stuff where people have actually set up non-organic materials in laboratory environments and then prodded them, poked them, shot them with a bit of electricity, and then just stood back and said, what happens? And these experiments are fascinating, and I'd suggest anybody who's interested in this, go on to Wiki, um, look up abiogenesis, in other words, the origin of life. And there you'll find a whole discussion of all the research that's going on, the results that have been found, and it is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, we were even discovering that you can create all the bases for DNA, all of them, in laboratory situations spontaneously without any intrusion of any supernatural activity or whatever. So every building block of life is there. And because those organic molecules are what you'd call self-aggregated. That is the attribute of organic molecules. As soon as you've got them, they tend to want to clump together and become bigger, more complex molecules. It's an inherent transcendent property of organic molecules. It's why there's so many big organic molecules all out in space. It's why the night sky is not lit up like the day sky with an infinite number of stars out there. The night sky should be as bright as the day. It's not because there's so much organic stuff out there blocking it. There are 74 amino acids been found in meteorites, even here in Australia, coming in from outer space. This is what organic molecules do. I might digress just for one second and say, you think, well, is that a strange thing? Think about the water molecule. We know about the water molecule. It's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, right? H2O. It's very simple. Dihydrogen oxide, if you're trying to threaten a school teacher and try to... My daughter did this, you know. She went to the school teacher and she said, uh, we heard there's a rumor there's dihydrogen oxide in here and we want it banned. You know, and I got all excited about it. But you think about that molecule. It's so simple, and yet you drop it down from... 10,000 meters up, and it comes down as the most intricately beautiful thing, a snowflake, with millions of different complex things. And these are emergent from that little molecule of water. It is what water does. It's, a, it's an attribute of water molecules. Life may be the snowflake of organic molecules. It probably had to happen. Once you have organic molecules, they start to accumulate. So the answer to your first question is, yes, you can test it with, with pre-symbiotic um, simulation experiments. That doesn't prove that's what happened. 
But you can, this is what's being happen, been happening now, is we're showing that you can set up a situation where all the basic steps in construction of life, including all the building blocks, can be created instantly in a laboratory with no fanciness involved at all. Just heat and a little spark, like lightning. You they can the also be tested. There's three ways. The second way it can be tested is by living organisms. Are, do we see evolution occurring amongst living organisms? Do we see one species becoming another? And the answer is yes. There's so many examples of this that have been under observation, from chromosomal speciation to all kinds of things. And the third way, which is my favorite, is the fossil record. Does the fossil record actually show us a track record of this transformation of the bioblob, its various portions, into portions in, in younger time frames? Do we see the evidence that this actually happened? And that's what we, we do see. So these are not proofs, but they urge you to say the probability that this happened um, is high. And we see all the basic steps from, from simulation experiments to working with living organisms to working with the fossil record, the track record, the dandruff of life that's been left behind. And it all tends to say the same thing. The only question is really, where did life start? Is it possible life even came from outer space, the panspermia idea? Or did the simulation or the aggregation of the molecules transforming simple inorganics into organics happen on Earth? These are still active areas of research, before, but it's a very good question. Before we go on to the second question Paul asked, could I ask you just very briefly, could you imagine a piece of evidence that would actually falsify the evolutionary model? Well, I guess if the fossil record did not provide evidence of missing links between the hypothesized related kinds of, of organisms on Earth, um, that would keep me very skeptical. But I see these links continually turning up that are tying it all together. Right. So, so if, if, if I, the when you think about when, yeah. when Darwin came up with his concept of evolution, there was almost nothing to support what he was saying other than the hypothetical understanding he had of what possibly was happening here. He didn't understand genetics. The fossil record was gruesome. The only sort of so-called missing link that we had at the time was Archaeopteryx, a link between a reptile and a bird. He could, he could vaguely see that. That had only just happened when Darwin started to do that work. So since the 1830s, the 1850s, all of this new evidence has been coming along and is supporting basically what he said. The genetics suddenly provides a mechanism to rationalize what he thought must be happening. So well, could, we, could we, it be disproved? If we move on to the second yes, question. Okay. So the question of mind and consciousness. That yes, seems that, to be that's a, a really good question too. Sure. And, and as they say, the uh, problem of mind is one of the hardest problems because here we are using our minds trying to understand this. And some people would even say that it's impossible for humans to understand how minds operate because we have to use our own brain to try to work that out. And, and this is kind of regarded as a conundrum. But gradually we are discovering as we understand how the minds of other organisms work. As you go back through the, um, the chain of being, as you were, if you like, that, that leads up to higher primates, to uh, the Caterine primates, our group, um, we find increasingly, fascinatingly, complex mental activities going on in other animals. It's not unique to humans. It may be a question of degree. Maybe we do more of it than some other organisms. But I look at my dog. I watch my dog working out problems when I haven't given it what it wants. I know it's problem solving and it's manipulating me. And, and we know from studies with chimpanzees and all kinds of other animals, even right down to octopuses, watching one octopus watch another octopus learn how to take the lid off a jar to get a, a crab out, and then that second octopus just watching goes over to the same experimental situation, instantly goes to the jar, unscrews it, and grabs the crab. They're learning. They're using the same kind of cerebral activity that we do. It may only be a question of degree, not kind. I'm not sure. It's fascinating. Would either of the other panelists want to say anything on either of those two questions uh, before well, we go uh, on? The, the thing with, because uh, uh, Paul mentioned uh, uh, the image of God in us, uh, that's a, uh, uh, one of those typical uh, things uh, where uh, we can or we should draw the line between uh, theology or the theological perception mm -hmm. and the scientific perception. And uh, if you're into the Church Fathers, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, in his uh, book uh, on the making of the human being, chapter 16, 
There he discusses this matter. And he, he draws a line between um, human nature, uh, which is uh, psychosomatic, again, complex, mental element, uh, spiritual element, whatever, and the image of God. And he uh, refuses to associate the reality that we usually call image of God with anything in the psychosomatic uh, nature of, of a human being. Okay. Um, we, I, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, just answering Paul's questions, I think, I think, yeah, it's it's fair to say that evolution is definitely a, a scientific theory in the sense that it can be um, there can be evidence for it and it can be disproved. Um, obviously, if the if the fossil record was in reverse order in terms of time pr time frames, or if there was random gaps um, or things seem to be punctuated, then it wouldn't fit and wouldn't make sense. So, I think it's fair to call it um, a, 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 a scientific theory, which it is. Um, the other thing of uh, I, I have a lot of objections to what Professor Archer was saying about the um, about the origin of life. That's that's currently um, under investigation. There's there's no there's no evidence at the moment that their uh, abiogenesis um, is even possible uh, without any without any intervention from any intelligence. And a lot a few scientists are you know that's why they they're hypothesizing they're basically using the origin of life as as a kind of a, a pointer to the, the fact that there might be intelligence somewhere in the, else in the universe that might have um, planted um, uh, life on Earth just because of how improbable it is and how its genetic information is needed. So it needs to be ordered in a correct way um, to get to a certain function. And that's why it's, it's an information. It's like if you found a book somewhere, you would automatically infer that there was some sort of intelligence that, that made it there. But if you found just a conglomeration of, of letters, you would think that it might be random. Um, and your, your second question as well about um, uh, how evolution ex explaining mind, body. Um, I'm not sure if, um, fr from a naturalistic perspective, um, it's, it's difficult to say whether uh, naturalists, most naturalists um, that, that I'm aware of are materialists in the sense that they say everything in the universe is physical. Um, and so they kind of, they reduce the, the mind down to the brain. Um, and this is one of the advantages, I think, of being a theist in the sense that um, you, you just just imagine being an being an atheist. You would you would have to say that all of the um, the creation and all of the um, evolutionary sorry all of the evolutionary process um, is is random and is not intended to bring out humans and it's not intended to bring out um, a, a certain it didn't have a, a, an end in mind um, and so it would kind of it would kind of um, lead you to question your own your own uh, mental faculties because. You, wh why do you have any any justification for trusting your own uh, mental faculties and giving you the ability to reason correctly? Because it's not like you're, um, from a Christian perspective, God created and designed our minds in, in his likeness in the sense that we've got a moral compass, we've got reason, we've got um, rationality. So it makes perfect sense why we're able to interpret these things. Um, and understand and interact with those things. But um, on an evolutionary perspective, um, your mind is just a, a chance result of a, a throughout time in, in the universe, and so is it really reliable in the information that it gives you? So that's a question that um, atheists have to answer themselves. Okay, we might move on to the next question. We don't want to leave someone standing all night thank and you. then not get to ask their question at the end. <laughs> uh, thank you. My name's uh, Anthony. I'm also um, a doctor and a very interested in um, science and biology. I um, also came from a more fundamentalist uh, background and then kind of morphed into ID and then more into just, I uh, think, of fathers a, uh, a kind of uh, viewpoint that they're quite separate um, and don't, uh, they're, they can be harmony but they don't necessarily integrate except in myself. In, uh, seeing reality uh, as uh, when I look around myself. I was wondering though, um, is this really a perspective that the scriptures allow? Um, for instance, in uh, the Psalms and uh, particularly Romans 1, it says the handiwork of God uh, reveals the invisible attributes of God. So while I I, I sympathise mostly with your position, Father, that uh, it's very separate. I was wondering, really, does the agency um, and the, me the mechanism of the world that we see, does it, if it 
if the scriptures say that that says something about the agency, can there really be such distinction between the sciences and the theology or the philosophy of theology? So who'd like to have a go at that one? Yeah. Yeah, th that's a fair point. Uh, but uh, you need to understand that reality is one thing and our perception or perceptions it's a different story. Yeah? Uh, I'm not for uh, any mixture of uh, theology and science, but this has nothing to do with, well, sorry to say, reality. Yeah? A theological viewpoint, of, a theological per uh, perception of reality always points to God or tries to interpret things from the viewpoint of God. Interpret being the word. Uh, a scientific viewpoint uh, is less interpretive and is more explanatory. Uh, a scientist uh, tries to make sense of things. How are they made uh, in that? What are they made of? That's basically the question. What things are? How these phenomena work, operate? That doesn't require interpretation. When you interpret, you say, either naturalism or supernaturalism, and even the professor, although he agreed with me at some point uh, that we should do away with uh, these categories, still uses uh, naturalism and, and says, well, there's nothing fancy, no supernatural uh, uh, fingertip there, you know? Well, how can you tell? Um, and uh, uh, what I try to say is the fact that methodologically, uh, theology and, and any science, not only biology, you know, uh, are so different that uh, there's no way in which you can actually bridge them. You know? They uh, operate on different terms. But reality is something that we are all interested in. Uh, and my point is not in uh, making uh, room for this science or another science. My point is, let's work with uh, what's at hand and the question for me as a Christian is, uh, is that something that affects my faith in God as creator, provident, who's always at work, not only from time to time, in the gaps? I have to step in there and just say, again, um, I don't see any reason why anything that's discovered through scientific investigation should threaten anyone's faith. I just don't see that. And I agree. I think we're in the same ballpark there. But you did say that you said, how can I say that I don't see the evidence of a supernatural hand in the natural world that we study and investigate? Um, and I'm not saying that it's not there. I'm saying I just, without the evidence, I have nothing to say about it. And that's, that's my main point. We have nothing to say about theology. It is perfectly compatible with science. And one of the main messages I give to students in first year biology in the University of New South Wales, don't let even some of the creationists tell you that you have to reject your understanding of evolution or you're rejecting your God. I'm saying that's simply not true. It's they, the same they, from my viewpoint. I know that. We are on the so, same side. Can, can I ask? I'm tempted to finish the night we because we've agreed on something. <laughs> but no. Um, can I ask? I mean, something I've noticed among many uh, you know, um, atheistic, for want of a better word, scientists is the sense of awe and wonder at nature, at the beauty of nature, at the complexity of it. At, and I think that's what Anthony was getting at when he, uh, when he said about, you know, the heavens show the handiwork of God. I'm just wondering, do you, do, is there a difference, what is the difference between a Christian being in awe of nature and seeing the handiwork of God and a non-Christian being in awe of nature but not attributing to God. What are the similarities and differences there? I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that. Well, I think Ab Abram um, al already, um, already gave the answer, you yeah, know, with the, the, the writer of the, the book, you know. So a, 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 a believer, yeah? you have a book. You said it's, it's a rational, logical message, yeah? That's a book. 
yeah? yeah. Some someone yeah, the, the someone yeah, wrote, wrote that book, you know. Book. If it's just the letters, but, you know. But what if I don't think that anyone wrote it, but no. I just still think it's wonderful? Well, that, but, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's a compilation of different books, and I guess a, a little bit of skepticism on my part, as we know, there are an awful lot of potential texts that could have gone into that book, as we've just discovered with the recent discovery of that text, which shall remain unmentioned, and causes some conflicts of interpretation. Um, it is a compilation of ideas that are about 3,000 years old or more. Yeah, I, I think you meant the Book of Nature yeah. is what ah, he's talking the about, the Book of Nature. Ah, different yeah. matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From, from my perspective um, as a Christian, uh, when, when, like when I look at the, the beauty and the, like, the majesty and the, the awesomeness of creation, it, it kind of it lets you to reflect back on the Creator um, and, and their, 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 physical, their attributes. And it also just makes me want to... Um, uh, also makes me want to find out how kind of how, how it happened, what was the way in which he did it, and and, and that's why I think there's there's a motivation from from my perspective to, to find out the, the mechanisms and how, how things happen and how God um, you know in, in integrated the and, and how that fits in with with, with his spiritual message because um, I think that there is a relationship between uh, the, the spiritual message the spiritual message of Christianity and the way in which the world looks. Um, and so to explore that relationship, I think, is, is important and adds to the richness um, of, of your Christian experience. So that's interesting because we're coming now, like, although I think we've all agreed that science and faith do different things, but now we're kind of seeing that they do intersect in some ways as well. They do yeah, it, influence it, each other in some it, it ways. Depend, it depends what you define. It depends what you define them as. Um, if, if, you're, if, you're a, if, if you're insisting that uh, a religion has to make specific factual claims about um, physical things, um, then, then it does intersect into the bounds of science. And if science is, for example, um, uh, making uh, postulating things that maybe are not, not physical, then science is entering into the realms of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So uh, they both can intersect. Um, the question is they shouldn't. Or Tread with care. Yeah, um, shall we we'll move on to the next question. And what we might do, we've got three people standing there. We'll have three rapid-fire questions with three rapid-fire sets of answers, and then we'll finish off the night. All right, great. Um, so you guys talked about uh, not just whether or not evolution uh, and creation are compatible, but you guys seem to touch on as well if, whether this question is important as a Christian or as a, um, as a scientist uh, and all that. Um, and also, Professor Archie talked about whether or not science can or can't prove things. Um, and so my question uh, to you is uh, this idea you referenced Karl Popper that science can't uh, really prove things. Uh, Popper went further, though, in the sense that he didn't just say science can't prove things, but he said that he criticized the whole inductive method, saying that we can't, he was one of the few critics saying we can't say things are even probably true. I'm not sure if um, you hold this view as well, but it did lead you to say that science has nothing to do with God. It can't prove God. It can't disprove God. Um, but what science can do is it can provide reasons to believe certain premises, right, in arguments for God. So a classic example is if you take any of the cosmological arguments or the more recent ones, if someone takes a scientific theory like the Big Bang Theory, they can say that this provides evidence for, um, for uh, provides support for a premise uh, as evidence for the existence of God. So I'd like to know what you think um, about that. And just quickly as a follow-up to uh, Father Kostaki, was it? Doesn't matter. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I understood. Uh, your, I'm not sure if I understood your position correctly, so I apologise if it's a bit of a misrepresentation. But it seems like um, it seems like it, it was at least implied that much of this about the intersection between uh, creation and evolution it doesn't really matter to me uh, as an individual Christian. Um, and while I, I agree with the sentiment, I think one reason that it does matter is because uh, it gives Christians, or it means Christians have reasons to believe their faith is at least justifiable, and not something that's taken by faith apart from reason. So I, you know, I can have my faith and my own interpreta my own interpretations, and someone from another religion and, or another faith can have their faith and their own interpretations. But I think one reason some of the science can be important is because it can make you, um, it can lead to more reasonable beliefs. You know, what makes me say that my belief belief is any more or less true than another. Okay. Well, that was two for the price of one. Well, I think can, can, can we do a 60-second response from each of the... Yeah, I distilled two points out of that. One was your question about Popper's sort of um, skepticism about whether probability statements were even justifiable. I, I must say, intuitively, I don't share that view. I think at the end of the day, while we can't say with certainty... Um, that we have proven anything in science because somebody's likely to find that there's some even even things like the speed of light 
which we thought was an absolute constant that underpinned all the basic physics, the physical understanding of the universe. And one of our people in the University of New South Wales demonstrated, in fact, that there's been a tiny slowdown in the speed of light over a measurable period of time. So even that constant, which was supposed to be a truth, is suddenly wobbled a bit. But on the other hand, the probability is high. If I flip up a coin um, and said, what's the probability that it's going to come down again if I throw it up in the air, Everyone's going to say, well, you might as well make that a law because it is always going to come down. But we know the coin is made up of molecules, and the molecules only come down because they're all in random motion. Perversely, if all of those molecules just for one microsecond moved in the same direction, it might end up on the moon instantly. And because we know theoretically that could happen, we can't say it is a law or it's a truth that something will come down when we throw it up. So we keep everything fairly flexible. With that, I'm happy with Popper, but probability, I think, is important. I missed that. Try that again. You might have to go to the microphone, so we can hear it properly. Sorry, so you also talked about how um, science can't have anything to say about God. And right. so my point was, if it can say things are probably true, then it can provide evidence for premises as arguments for the existence of God, and so science does have things to say about God. Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, you mean that, in fact, scientists could theoretically talk about the probability of an existence of God? I guess you couldn't deny that categorically at all. But I'd have to say, from the scientific point of view, if there isn't tangible evidence that could be examined, then you'd say the probability is low, but it is never going to be zero. And in that space is where faith fits perfectly comfortably. Um, there's other kinds of evidence that convince people that there is a God. And if these are personal experiences, these are revealed truths and texts and so on. So. Some people are convinced by some kinds of evidence the scientists want something they can examine. If you, can't, if you can't examine it, then they say, it could be true, it might not be true, but it's not the kind of thing we can deal with. It's not something that's so, our, in our zone of understanding. Father Dora, do, do we need scientific support for our faith? Does that mean that other religions are then just as well justified as ours since there's no seemingly objective uh, scientific I don't know about support? other religions. Sorry? I don't know about other religions. I know just the fact that I don't need any kind of scientific proof in order to believe. And that's what uh, Professor Archer uh, pointed out. Uh, and if you want empiric proofs... There we go. The, those are the only proofs. The rest is just dust in the wind. <laughs> those are the proofs. The saints. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I tend to agree in the sense that science directly doesn't have anything to say about um, God because uh, science deals with what's physical and um, God, by definition, according to our understanding, is an immaterial thing. So it's not, it's not like it can be tested and quantified in any certain way. But science does have things to say about whether or not things are true in the natural world. And then those things can be used um, to infer the existence of God or infer the existence of design based on um, what we can see. Um, and sorry, what was the second question? I forgot the... Uh, thing. Oh, about the... I think, I think um, as an individual person, you can be content in living with your own faith um, based on the fact that you grasp God in an experiential way and you know that he's true based on your experience of him. Um, you don't necessarily need arguments. The, the value of the arguments come in when you're, when you're trying to speak to people from other faiths and you're trying to give them other objective justifications of, of, of why you think that, you know, it's, it's, it's makes, on the balance of evidence, it makes more sense to believe that some, someone is, a, uh, makes more sense to believe in Christianity because of such and such reasons. Okay, our second last question. Sorry, um, I might just keep pushing that point. Um, I might kind of jump on Abraham's defense a bit and um, <laughs> sorry father I can see you <laughs> not impressed but um, I, I want to kind of just yeah why is it so um, important to keep I think science and faith uh, separate I do feel like they do like I said operate in different realms but I don't think that they're completely opposed to each other or don't have anything to offer or something to say so um, like you mentioned I think um, I know you said you don't care about other religions, but there um, are certainly other claims that are made by other religions, or even Christianity, like young earth creationists would have certain claims that would be in direct uh, contrast with scientific you know, claims. 
so I guess my point is, um, I, well, my question is, would it be okay to be using scientific uh, claims to justify your faith, uh, or is it? Is that such a big problem hmm. to, to so do? We, we have sort of talked about that issue. We'll just get a response from Father, and then we'll go on to the okay. last very, question. Very, very, very uh, simple one. Uh, for a believer, uh, and also someone that is on, on a spiritual path, yeah, where there are proofs that cannot be quantified, yeah, uh, any kind of scientific support or uh, logical um, uh, proof and so on and so forth is irrelevant. Okay. Sorry, can I just just a second? Example? Just a second. Okay. okay. So, if you know what prayer means, you know that you you don't need to know the parameters of the universe, constants or not. Yeah, the blob and and that you don't need anything. Yeah. Okay. Now, where do you need and where do I need? This is why uh, I'm interested in science and religion. Where where do I need uh, uh, scientific information? is precisely when I have to converse with people that are of a different conviction than mine. Yeah? In order to uh, have an idea of the uh, biological duel that, uh, that took place here, I exaggerated a bit, not that I understood everything, but a few things I understood because I happen to read a lot of popular science. Yeah? And I do that, I do that because of these kind of duels. But here, we are all friends, thank God. Yeah? Uh, but there are instances where we aren't friends. And this is where you should be equipped. Yeah? That, uh, to cut it short, for my faith, no, I don't need it. For m the mission of the church, yes, I need to be informed. Okay, yeah, good. Okay. All right, thank I, you very I, much. I just wanted to next point one, out. We won't go on to the next one, because the time's running okay. out. Sure. Thank you. Last one. So you said that... Um, there's the, the, the Bible provides a how, sorry, a who, but not a how, right? Mm. So. That's simplistic, but yeah. So from what, from what I see from the, from the first three chapters of Genesis, I, I see that there is a how. The, 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 the first, this, this first seven days, they, they do seem to be a how of, like, how, like, a how. But you say that this how is a metaphor, but... Well, I haven't used yet the word, but I'll use it soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we, but how can you say that it is like not as exactly as it is when the Bible itself doesn't say so? In other cases, like in Revelations, it says that it's a vision, or the same with uh, Jacob's ladder, or the the parables that Jesus speaks of. They say that these are analogies. They are not. They are not hard hmm, truths. And while it, and you take Genesis one, for instance, as something else than an analogy and a metaphor. Since it doesn't say that it is one, it you, you must assume. That okay, well, can, can I just interrupt, interrupt just for one sec? It is interesting. It does not say in the original text seven days or the creation of the world in seven days. It says yom is the word, the Hebrew word yom, and it means a period of time. It's not a defined day. So there is a great deal in the, um, in the how, if you like, that is subject to interpretation from one version of the text into another language and into another language that can um, maybe bring it closer to a metaphor. If you say yom is a period of time, that leaves a great deal of latitude for an overlap between science and the account that's in the Genesis account. Maybe that's billions of years. Maybe a yom in the original sense of the creator was a billion years. It doesn't actually say day. That's, that's something that crept in in the translation into the, um, into the English versions of the Bible. As so, a matter of fact, St. Simeon the Theologian at the end of the 10th century said exactly that, that those are thousands, he said, thousands of years. Uh, I haven't said you're looking at me and kept talking about Bible. I mentioned biblical only once. Usually I say scripture. Uh, but I haven't mentioned too much of it. I'm not Bible-centered. I'm not a Bible-centered Christian. I'm Christ-centered. Yeah? Christianity is about Christ, not a book. Yeah? How do you read 
Genesis 1 is very important. And Genesis 1, by the way, is not something that a novice in the faith reads, at least not without guidance. Yeah? One of those texts that cannot be read like Wikipedia. Um, so, have you looked at the structure of the text? That text is built not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. It's built symmetrically. 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. And you have the first verse that is be, uh, before all the days. And you have the seventh, again, out of the symmetry. Yeah? Uh, that's how you are supposed to read. 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. And your entire system of beliefs crumbles. Because yours is built on a misreading of the scriptures, yeah? as though it's a textbook, scientific textbook. It's never that. I think that's a. I think that's a very important point um, about just in general about uh, interpreting the scripture. It's you don't just pick it up and read it and you're like oh it's just what it says. Um, it's important to use the um, what the fathers say in, in, in about in how, how to interpret that scripture in its original context in when it was written and how all the styles that it's used. So if you just look at that table um, at the top there, it's, it's it talks about what father was saying about how it's not it's broken up into like phrases. So it's it's more like it's more like stanzas. So it, it kind of has parallel those where in the first it says um, God created the, the light and then in paragraph 4 he talks about the, the sun and the moon and then luminaries. The second, yeah luminaries so if you can see that it, it, it kind of parallels there there's, there's features basically within the text itself that suggest that it's meant to be taken in, in not as a scientific report um, it happened X Y Z it's, it's, it's meant to describe God's um, creation of the world um, and, and the message behind it is the fact that there is the creator and designer of the universe, as opposed to what other people were saying at that time, as that the earth itself was something to be worshipped and something to be created. Um, and even even small phrases like when God says, let the earth bring forth uh, living creatures, that, like he, God could have just said, or the text could have said, for example, um, God said, let there be creatures, and there was creatures. But it doesn't say, it says, let the earth bring forth. So that kind of suggests that there's some sort of, God's inbuilt the earth with some sort of potentiation to kind of develop things in itself. So there's all these um, little aspects um, uh, I encourage you to, to, to read into it that suggests the text itself should be interpreted with a bit more flexibility. By the way, uh, that, that's a very good example. St. Basil the Great in the 4th century in his uh, interpretation of the Exhymer on the six days of creation uh, uh, gives a, a, a tremendous interpretation that is relevant to uh, what Abraham said. Uh, he says, that word of God runs that's his verb runs through creation from that day on till the end. So the same activity that uh, Genesis, one way or the other, uh, speaks about, the same activity is unfolding, ongoing. Speaking of till the end, <laughs> I believe we've come to the end of our night. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I, I hope you've enjoyed the three very different perspectives that our panelists have represented tonight. And as I said at the beginning, the goal of these meetings is not to give you a black and white answer, and I think you'll agree with me, we've achieved that goal. Uh, what we have given you, I hope, is um, three different ways of thinking about it. I hope that each of us today actually try to um, learn something new and get something from a perspective that we didn't have before so that we can improve our understanding, and hopefully that will help you in your own questions that you're asking and trying to find out. Um, uh, after we finish, as usual, there will be some snacks at the back of the church. I'm not sure if any of our panelists have the energy or the time to hang around for a little bit more, uh, but in case they don't, we'd certainly like to say a very warm thank you to them for their time and their efforts tonight. It's, it's been a pleasure.